Turn in your Bibles, please. This is going to sound similar to some of you who have seen, who have heard this already, but even if I preach the same sermon, I can never preach the same sermon twice because I don't have the same group of people in the room. I'm not the same guy that I was on Tuesday. I'm a different guy today because, let's face it, every day we wake up is a different day. Every day there's just little subtle changes in who we are. Our goal today is to try to is to try to, as, a, as individuals, and as a group, to try to reach the place where that's a positive change, where that change leads us into a place where we are more in tune. What's the, who's, of all the things that guide our lives, I mean, all of us are looking for guidance in our lives. Our country, we had some people who were called the Founding Fathers. You've probably heard of them, Jefferson, and Hamilton, and Washington, and some of those folks that did an interesting job, and they decided that this country needed to be guided by some principles. And so they put them down and they wrote a thing called the Constitution. And it becomes the, it is, in spite of, in spite of the utter and complete ignorance of our current group of law, <laughs> it is still supposed to be the guiding principle for this country. And it's a pretty good set. It, it worked pretty good for a long, long time ways to make a lot of money and then things change because man is corruptible but the word of God that which makes us born again is incorruptible so this as our guide becomes the thing that takes us in a direction different from the direction that this world is going in that's why we don't we don't fit in well with the immoral. We don't fit in well with the unkind. We don't fit in well with the unloving. We don't fit in well with the selfish. We don't fit in well with the cruel because God has moved us from one place to another place. As we're going, by the, by the way folks, nobody arrives the moment they get saved. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. We get this huge change that occurs on the inside. That then, over a period of time, begins the process of working its way to the outside so that the world sees it. But make no mistake, that was, a, that was an enormous change. I mean, getting saved is the most enormous change there is. And people say, we need change. Go to Jesus. Jesus is the greatest agent for change in the universe. No one can change you like Jesus can change you. He change, when, he gets a, when, when he gets into your heart, it's a whole new, it's a whole new ball game. We, listen, if, we, if we're going to fall back into the, 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 the old desires, we're going to have to work at it because God is busy trying to move it. He's trying to move us away from what we were and where that, where that world is. And by the way, it's not the world, folks. It's, it's the way the world operates. I don't hate the people in the world. I, I feel sorry for them because they're under the bondage of the devil or their own flesh and whatever else is controlling them. And they can, they, they're powerless to move from here to here. They're powerless to get where we are unless they get who we got. That's the reality. Here it is. What Pastor Pete said that early in Sunday school. He said, what's the, def what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing in the same way and expecting what? Different results. Well, that's, not, that's never going to happen. That's why when the world rejects Jesus, and by the way, the, in the process of rejecting him, a lot of times they'll reject who else? And they'll reject us too, because they can't reach him, so they'll try to reach us. So they're going to be. Hey, hey, listen, if you have problems with the rejection, I'd suggest that you begin to get over them immediately, because you're going to get some of that in this life as a Christian, because you now rep, you are the only. For many people, you are the only visible representation of the Lord Jesus Christ on this planet. And when they reject him, they also do what? When they reject you, so. Rejection is something Christians have to learn to accept. And then, but you know, the hardest part is not taking it personally. Don't take it personal. It's Jesus who they're trying to get at, and they can't get at him, so they get at you. They know that there's a problem. They know, they are aware of the fact that they have a problem. They just can't figure out, they, they, can't, they can't swallow their pride enough to figure out that Jesus is the answer. So they'll 
try to take it out on the people who are reminding them that Jesus is the answer. We have something we all have to get used to. It's something as we grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we come to realize, yeah, they're mad at us, but they're not as mad at us as they are at Jesus. <laughs> That's who they're mad at. They're mad at somebody who says, I'll fix you, but you've got to swallow your pride and come to me. And that's too hard for some people. That's one of the problems that we have. I don't go out of my way to look for trouble. I don't go out of my way to make enemies with the gospel. I don't do that. But I, I came to the realization a long time ago, trouble comes your way, don't be afraid of it. <laughs> don't go looking for it, but never back down from it. Jesus suffers from too much bad you know how I talk about PR, public, public relations? Jesus suffers from a lot of bad PR. There's a lot of stuff that's been done in the name of Christianity that has nothing to do with Christianity. I'll give, it, I'll give, a, simple, I'll give a simple thought here. The LGBT community. Are Christians working hard to reach those people? Not very. That is an area of ministry that is underserved because, because frankly... For a lot of us, the practices of their lifestyle makes your skin crawl. It causes you to recoil. It's like, yeah, you're doing that? <laughs> you know? And it's hard for us to get past that. I know. Listen, I grew up in a time when we didn't even know there was a closet, let alone that there was anybody inside it. More likely, it was just nailed shut, and it was never, you know, never heard from me. It's just like, that was, you know, that was, that was something very, very, very strange. So this has been... This, uh, I'm 61 years old, so what I've, what I've experienced since, oh, say, high school graduation until now, it's been a bit of a shock to my system. I've had to get used to a lot of things. I've had to learn to, I've had to, learn to deal with things. And we have two ways of dealing with things. We can deal with them positively, or we can deal with them negatively. How am I going to reach? i got people like that in my family. How am I going to reach them? Well, very simple. The, 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 answer, the answer is actually pretty simple. You love them the same way you love any other sinner. Do you, can you excuse the sins of the people that aren't that way? Well, no, but you, you, learn, you learn to deal, you learn to work around it and not let it become the thing that defines the relationship you have with them. You can have relationships with people who do not agree with you. You can do that. You just can't allow it to be something. You cannot allow right and wrong to change because right and wrong cannot change. Those things simply cannot change. Well, what do we do? Well, we do the best we can. The best we can is to learn to love people in spite of what they are. Bearing in mind that at every point in your life, Jesus has loved us in spite of what we are. Makes it easier to deal with people that would normally, that might upset us, might disturb us, might, might make us react in a negative way, but the reality is that we are, we are still representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ loves what, what group of people? Sinners. Sinners included. Not just, it's not a just us club. Jesus still loves and cares for those that are lost. He still has that concern. That was free. That doesn't come with, that doesn't come with it. Come with the sermon. Galatians chapter 2, if you would please. Galatians chapter 2. Listen, we are... We are finding our way. That's what this life is all about. We are finding our way. Our way is, it, how is, how is this way? Well, let, let me put it to you like this. Pastor Pete in, in, in Sunday school read uh, from Psalm 1. It said, uh, blessed is the man that, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth, nor standeth in the way of sinners. See, everybody has a way, and what we're doing is we're finding our way. We're moving from the way that the world taught us. To the way that Jesus wants us to move. And to the direction he wants us to move in. Finding our way is important and we're doing it every day of our lives. But it doesn't come. It isn't autopilot. It's not like an automatic transmission that doesn't do all the work for you. It's something that we consciously choose. Pastor Pete in Sunday school talked about the decision-making process. Making decisions is, is a very... Listen, we, we don't realize how often we're making decisions as we're just going through our everyday lives. We're making decisions. And many times we're making those decisions based on our prior experiences and not on the new man, not on the Word of God. 
Now, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. I meant to start this off by talking about the law, so I'm going to give the law a couple of minutes. We talk about the law of the Old Testament. The law of the Old Testament is a lot more than the Ten Commandments. Although the Ten Commandments, as a moral guideline, exists today. The dietary law, that's gone. The ceremonial law, going to the temple to worship and sacrificing animals, that's gone. The moral law still exists. Those things contained in the Ten Commandments are still there to give us what? Anybody know why the Ten Commandments exist? For no other, if there's no other reason. There's, there's two very good things that the Ten Commandments, obeying the Ten Commandments will do for you. Do you know what they'll do? They'll keep you out of jail. They'll give you a peaceful life. <laughs> That's what they'll do. They won't get you to heaven. There's no law that can get you to heaven. It doesn't exist. Doing right didn't get you to heaven before you got saved. Doing right isn't going to get you to heaven after you got saved. But it will if we follow the things contained in those principles, those things will bless our lives because we, because we will be in a place where God can bless us. That's one of the problems. People say, I wish I had this, I wish I had that. One of the things I tell people, have you put yourself in a place where God can do something for you? Because if you're in this place where God says, I, I, I don't want to travel over there. Don't put yourself in a place where God doesn't want to hang around. Put yourself in a place where he does. The law can, one thing, one thing that the law cannot do is save us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, and it says this. Knowing this first, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. And it ends up the verse... Uh, in very, in very uh, succinct fashion, it says, For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That is, that, that was, that is just the reality of things. The reality of things that if, 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 if we could have righteousness by the law, then there was absolutely no need for Jesus Christ to come. Jesus is the one upon whom everything that we do must rest. Everything we do has to, everything that we are has to rest on him. Turn over to Galatians chapter 3. And look at, look at what it says in verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, then verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Never confuse citizens and fellow human beings with believers because they are not. We are different. We have been changed. It's a different category. Look at verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. There's a lot of people out there that are going to tell you that they are going to, they're going to become, they're, 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 they're going to, they're going to, they're justifying their, their, their entrance into heaven, their goodness, their religious practice, whatever they're doing, because they're working on their, they're working on their salvation. I'm not working on my salvation. Jesus did all the work in my salvation. If I'm following the law, I'm not following, I'm not following it by the faith of Jesus Christ, knowing that it cannot save me, knowing that it's entirely on him. Look at verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. I want to make that point. We are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Those that are in the family of faith, those that are of the household, what the Bible calls the household of faith, we have an obligation to each other, and it's something to remember. We have this obligation. That obligation was created through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was paid for by God's blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. That's Acts chapter 20, verse 28. If you're wondering about, listen, we, we have to do the best we can by those in the household of faith. We can't always do it. Some people have needs that we cannot meet. Some people have 
have, have an attitude or a situation that has kept, that's keeping them from, from being helped. But we are to do the best we can. There's, a, there's so many, there are things in our, that God has, that, listen, we gave out, we gave, you gave your heart to Jesus, you gave your life to Jesus, Jesus hands it right back and puts it in your hands and says, you're still making decisions. Our decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, our decision to follow him is exactly that. It's our decision and it rests in our hands. It's not in anyone else's hands. Our hands. When people choose to say, I want to be a Christian, I want to enjoy the benefits of being a Christian, but I don't want to follow Jesus, they're in for what? They're for disappointment. At the very least, they're going to be disappointed because following is a decision that we make every day when we get out of bed. It doesn't relieve us from the responsibility to follow him. Romans chapter 8 in your Bibles, please. <clears throat> I'm thinking my voice is going to make it through this. We're going to try. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, X, Romans. If I had to be trapped on an island with one book of the Bible... I think I would choose for it to be Romans because it had, contains just about every essential doctrine in the Christian life. Romans chapter 8, verse, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And that's a wonderful thing. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. I want you to double check, go back, look at that verse again, and see where we just said. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus Christ was without sin. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I realize that the that that very same Bible tells us the very same book tells us that no man ever hated his own flesh. It says, but nourisheth it and cherish it. Okay? We care enough about our flesh to eat. We care about enough about our flesh to give it a shower once in a while. We care enough about our flesh to find the deodorant and occasionally find our way to the sink with a razor. Okay? It's still our flesh. By the way, as long as, we're, as, long as you have your flesh, you can do something for Jesus. Once it's gone, that, 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 that opportunity is over. So am I, against, am I, am I here to tell you to, to mortify the flesh and do weird things and wear a hair shirt and do like you do down in the Philippines, beat yourself with a, with a, with a whip on, on Easter? No. I'm just telling you, as, as, as a fellow believer who has the same problems that, that you have, that we have to... Look not to make the flesh the most important thing. If the flesh becomes the priority, we will make bad decisions and we will not be following Jesus. Listen, Pastor Pete, was, he told a funny today when he talked about the offering. He says, I'm praying, I'm praying that God will, will bring money to this church through your wallet. And he's right. Although God, I'm not going to limit what God can do. God has done some marvelous things around here when this church had some needs. God has done some amazing things to meet those needs. Just incredible. Stuff that, stuff that you write home about, okay? But the reality is, sometimes God can't trust us with money. Now why? Because we would get ourselves into trouble with it. And if it would get us into trouble, was God going to give it to us? He'd rather not. He'd rather keep us out of trouble. He would rather have us... Listen. Listen, we know ourselves. We think we know ourselves. Who knows us best? Yeah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus knows us. As I was joking around on Tuesday night, God knows us so well because God exists at every single point in time, all the time. 
So he knows our past, our present, our future. He understands our decisions. He doesn't control those decisions. I'm not one of those predestination guys. I'm one of those foreknowledge guys. Does God know the end from the beginning? He always has. Jesus came down knowing exactly what mankind was going to do to him. He knew exactly what was going to occur. He knew, the, he, knew he was going to get 12 disciples, and one of them was going to betray him. He knew that. That's foreknowledge. Did he do anything to change it? Predestination doesn't work. The only predestination that can occur in the Bible is this. From the moment that we received the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are now, there is a predestination that has just occurred. We are predestined to become sinless, conform to his image, and eventually be in heaven in that condition. But that's it. Everything else is this or this. God leaves choice in whose hands? Ours. The decision to follow Jesus is the one that we make sometimes on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. The flesh can get us into a world of trouble. Go a little further down in Romans 8. <clears throat> and look at verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. People have asked me sometimes, how do you do what you do and get done what you get done? And I say, I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a clue. I, I, the only clue I have in this verse is that verse, in verse 11, it says that he will quicken our mortal bodies. Well, how do you get more done? I think that's it. How are you getting it done? By, it's not me. I can't take credit for this. This is something God has done. Listen, I'll take that as a promise. I can get more done but I think I'm going to have to try to put the spirit above the flesh. See, the world thinks that if they get enough stuff and they meet, get all their needs met, that they can then become spiritual. They think that the spiritual flows from the physical. And that's not true. The physical flows from the spiritual. In other words... As your spiritual health increases, then your world becomes an enlarged place. There's how many people remember the prayer of Jabez thing that was going around a couple of years ago? Talked about talked about uh, the the guy in the Bible said he, he prayed. He said, "God, I, I I would that you would enlarge my I forget what the word he used. Borders. Yeah, enlarge my borders. Make it give me give me a bigger give me a bigger space." And God gave him a bigger space because Jabez was interested in the spiritual. That came, the, the physical flowed from the spiritual. The closer we are, there's two, two funny things can happen as we move towards being more spiritual. We can actually wind up getting more stuff. Here's the funny part. We wind up needing less stuff. That's how it works. You know, I'm a, I'm a Facebook guy. I'm always getting into trouble on Facebook. I always says, you put that on Facebook? I'm sorry. I did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Sometimes things... Uh, it's popular culture. Popular culture drives me a little bit crazy. I'm crazy enough. I've been working in a chemical plant for 35 years. You have to excuse me for my occasional flights of, uh, 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 of crazy. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is I just, like, they were talking about, it's like, like if, if Bruce Jenner's a woman... With the equipment that he has, then as a man who owns guns, then I must be unarmed. <laughs> I can't help. I can't help it. It just drives me crazy. The world's nuts. The world's a crazy place. It's just crazy. It's, and it's going And folks, it's gonna get crazy. It's gonna get crazy. We're, the world. The world has always thought that we're nuts. It turns out that we're the sane ones. You know? How can how can that be? Here it is. It's in the spirit of God. It's giving us the sense. It's giving us those. It's giving us those. The Spirit of God gives us the things, gives us the, 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 the sensibilities that the world does not have any longer. The world's just going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. But we have the ability to be. Listen, if Jesus is the light of the world, then we as Christians are a reflection 
of that life. And there's going to be people along the way that are going to say, there's something different about you. A lot of people think that. I work with, I work with a bunch of guys who are like, um, the expression my mom would have used is jailbirds. <laughs> okay? These guys are always getting arrested, thrown in jail. And, oh, and they're basically sociopathic personalities. And I'm just a complete, whatever I, to, me, to them, I'm like, who are you? You're just completely, you know, I've never met anybody like you. No, that's, that's right, because I, all you, all you know is people basically who go to jail. That's who you hang around with. It's a different world than the world I live in. My world is a different world. My world is a world where, 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 there is, where, there, where, there, where the future is not predicated on my current physical condition. My future is predicated on the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have eternal life. I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm, I'm enjoying the time here. I get to see the grandchildren, okay? I'm enjoying my time here, but I'm not so hung up on it that I'm willing, that I'm not willing to say goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, cruel world. I could leave. I could leave whenever I want. I'm looking forward to retirement, but you know I've got the best retirement plan in the universe. I'm going to spend. I'm going to spend eternity with with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to spend time. I'm going to spend time with those guys, those Old Testament prophets. They're going to be an interesting bunch. I'm going to spend time with those people in the Book of Acts. I'm going to ask him, how was that on the, when, I'm going to ask Peter, how was it on that day when you preached on, on the day of Pentecost and, and, and 3,000 people got saved? Tell me about that. Yeah, I'm going to enjoy myself. Because at this stage, at this stage, I understand that the spiritual is greater than the physical. It's wonderful that we have this. We have this benefit. It's there. It's for us. Romans chapter 8. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. But for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Listen, if you go home and turn on the Bills game, I'm not going to consider you unspiritual. I'm going to consider you a glutton for punishment. <laughs> but I'm not going to consider you unspiritual. God gave, us, God gave us this world. He put us in this country. This is an interesting place. We have, we have there are things in pop Listen, there are things in popular culture that are not wrong. Okay? Not everything in popular culture... However, not everything in popular culture that is not wrong is necessarily edifying. Jesus gave you a life to live. But while you're living it, this is the hard part, while you're living it, are you giving him the time here? Are you giving him this time? Because that's the time, that's the time that's the important time. Pastor Kevin Leary has been a big influence on me, Pastor First Baptist Church down in Hamburg. And he, he defined, I always had issues trying to define the word worship. People say, we're having a worship service. What does that mean? We're going to sing a bunch of songs. Wait a minute. That's a song service. That's not a worship service. Could worship occur in a song service? Sure it could. But does it necessarily have to? Okay, what kind of service are you in right now? What am I doing? I'm preaching. You're in a preaching service. Is that necessarily worship? Not, not necessarily. Might it occur in the process? Yes. So I've had a very, very hard time with worship. Well, I just worship Jesus. Well, you know, Pastor Larry gave me, gave me this, and I, I remind people of this, because as far as I can tell, it's the closest thing I've ever heard for a definition of worship. He said, all the moments that I'm thinking about God, those are moments of worship. All the moments that I'm not thinking about God, those are not. Now, if anybody in here is a brain surgeon, I want you to be, and you're operating on my brain, I don't want you to be spending all your time on worship. I want you to be thinking about what you're doing inside my head, okay? Because there's a time, as Pastor Pete said in Sunday school today, he says, there's a time for everything. But all that downtime, how much downtime do you, stop and think about this for a second. How much downtime do you have in a day? Turn on the TV set. I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an addict. I'm addicted. I'm addicted to the Velocity Channel. I'm a car nut. I've been a car nut since I was a little kid. 
I've been, I've been loony for cars, crazy for cars. I work on cars, play with cars, fix cars, give people advice on cars. Someday I want to spend some time restoring cars, but I love cars. I'm vehicular, I'm, vehic I'm vehicularly addled, okay? And I'll turn on, I'll turn on the Velocity Channel, and I'll think, oh, there's a rerun. Do I want to watch this again? Well, there's an hour of downtime right there. Well, if I do it on DVR, it's 44 minutes. There's, there's, there's 44 minutes of downtime when I could be doing what? I could either be doing something productive, I could be spending time in prayer, I could be spending time thinking about the people that God has brought in contact with my life, or I could be doing something really, really productive. I could be reading my Bible and meditating on the scriptures. Because, folks, the transformation, the ability to keep on making decisions in our lives is based, to a large extent, on the knowledge that we have. And the knowledge that God has provided for us is here. Here's the problem. We don't read it enough. How much downtime do you have in a day? Listen, I carry paper a lot more than I read it. Most of the time when I'm reading my Bible, it's on a computer screen. The world has changed. Technology is not wrong. It's just different. Okay? There are people, there are people on some of my preacher's pages on Facebook where you've got your music up on a screen. You must, you're being heavily influenced by the devil. <laughs> no. It's just technology. It's just something that you use. Okay? People get up. People, oh, you believe. You wouldn't believe how people get excited about it. Well, you listen to contemporary music. You must be of the devil. You don't listen to contemporary music. You must be stuck in the past. People are fighting over stupidity. Okay? The reality is that, what, is that, is that the precepts of the law, those things that we find in the Bible, those are the things that are worth getting lathered up about. People get lathered up over stupid stuff. We need to spend time. We need to spend more time. And listen, this has worked for me for, for 44 years. So don't count it out. Reading your Bible every day is a huge step in your life. Committing yourself to the idea that I'm going to pick that thing up and I'm going to read it every day. You know what the best time, best time of the day to read your Bible is? Whatever time your brain is fully awake. Some people, that doesn't happen until 11 o'clock in the morning. So the only best time is the best time for you. Listen, I would love to prevent you. I would love to present you with a formula. Do this at this time of the day. Do that at that time of the day. Always do this. Never do that. I'd love to present you with a formula that would fix all your problems and make you spiritual and cause you to become a spiritual giant. Guess what? It doesn't exist. It's the individual. It's the individual. I've heard people say, I'm spiritual because I read 10 chapters of the Bible a day. Really? Well, that means that you have time to read. That means two things. Maybe you don't work and you have time to read 10 chapters of the Bible a day. And two, maybe you're a very good reader. Some people in here might struggle to get through 10 verses. What's it based on? It's based on the individual. Who did Jesus save anyhow? You. You as an individual. You need. You won't. Each one of us, here's the, here's the part that's hard. This is why we have trouble getting along. Each one of us occupies this unique space in the universe. There's no other one like us. I was reading, in, I was reading on the internet the other day that, that every person has three people that looks a lot like them. They would be, like, wow, you must be like, you must be like so family. You must have a twin brother. You know, somebody must, so they say there's three people that look like you. And even if they did, it would not make them you. Because you are unique. It's our unique personalities, experiences, perceptions that no one else on the planet has. God, people say, you Christians all are, are all alike. Well, we're all alike in one thing. We're all alike in that we're saved, by, we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, we're going to heaven when we die, and, we're, and, 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 if, we're, and if we're blessed by, by good friends, we're enjoying the trip on the way. But here's, but here's the reality. It's each individual. God, God is that's why, that's why that's why the, the Calvinists drive me crazy with their predestination stuff. Don't, don't even tell me that stuff. People are so unique. I, I, for me, for me, the best part of my world is interacting with people who are different than I am. If everybody was like me, this would be a scary world. I, I, I wouldn't want to be in a church that had a bunch of people like me in it. It would scare me. <laughs> that would be that would be too scary. But the reality is, that, listen, we are, we, are, we are joint heirs with Christ. I want, you to, I want you to see this. Look at, look at verse 17, Romans 8. 
And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we also may, may also be, be also glorified together. Verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to com be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I, God never promises us a smooth road. There's bumps in the road for it, every life. Every life has its own share of troubles. Every life has its own share of sorrows. Every life has its own... Everybody's got their own share of problems to, to deal with, and some of those problems are, are kind of unique to the individual. The best we can do sometimes is to, is, to, is to have sympathy and empathy for the suffering of others and to show kindness to people in times of their troubles. Show as much, folks, it's not a kind world. Show as much kindness to your, to your brothers and sisters in Christ as you can. Show as much kindness to the people that are lost around you as you can. Don't be a sucker for them. So if you can show kindness, show kindness because God, listen, Jesus has been kind to us in, in ways that's, that's, that's not even possible to measure. So that has to be one of the great things that rules, that rules our life and our behavior and our conversation. Those things are very, very important. And one more minute here. I'm getting ready to close up. I want, you to, I want you to remember that Jesus emphasized the fact that the spiritual was the important. In John chapter 6, take, take one moment to turn there. In John chapter 6, Jesus said some things. Jesus challenged his disciples. I hope you're challenged by something today. I hope, I hope something that came, out, came, came, came around in this church today, either in your conversations with people, in the preaching, in the music, or... In, in your encounters. I hope something today challenged you. Because Jesus was in the business of doing that. He told his disciples in John chapter 6, he said, he said, tell you what, he says, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood or you'll, I'll, you'll, you'll have no part in me. And all the people went crazy. They were like, how can this man give us his flesh and, and his flesh and eat and his blood to drink? How can he do that? This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And many of them turned around and left. Because they didn't wait around for the explanation. Some people actually have a significant basis of their religion on the idea that you can actually eat God. They're wrong. John chapter 6. Look at verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? And then in verse 63, he gives them the explanation. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Then a little bit further down, it says, look at verse 66. From that time... Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And then, Jesus, then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And then Simon Peter answered him. <laughs> this is one of the times when Peter gets it dead on. He says, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. See, Jesus was teaching them the idea of being, be looking, at, looking at life from the spiritual and not from the physical. Do we have to take care of the physical? Yes, we have to go to work. If we like to eat, we have to go to work. If we, were like, we, we like to be wearing clothes, we got to go to work. Yeah, you got to work, you got to eat, you got to pay your bills. Listen, it's not a good testimony for Christians to be owing money. Not a good testimony. It's not, a, not a good testimony for us to be laid on our bills. I don't know why I'm saying that, but it's just the reality. We shouldn't be the kind of people that are always borrowing. We shouldn't be the kind of people that are always laid on our bills. If we have to modify our lifestyle so that we don't do that, it's better that we should change our lifestyle and live within our means. Everything the world throws at us across the TV set, the news, the magazine, ads, everything that you see, the Internet is loaded with it, is trying to get us to want stuff that we probably don't need, shouldn't have, 
and will make us broke trying to pay for it. If we are truly looking at the spiritual above the physical, again, it's funny, God can find more ways to bless us, but then we find that we have, that we need less to be blessed. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. There's a, there's a, le- there's a lesson in there. Finally, let's not forget the most, Im- the most important part. John chapter 15. And I'm done with this. When we, we're, we're, this, is, this is the end of the line. You'll make it in time for kickoff. I smile when I say that because wherever I go today, I'll probably end up watching some of the game anyhow. John chapter 15. Jesus says in verse 1, I am the true, fi- true, true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch that in me beareth not. Now, I'm not going to get deep into this thing, but I want you to look at verse 3. It says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, so more can no more can ye except ye abide in me. And then verse 5, he says, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. And then, at the end of verse 5, it says this, For without me, you can do nothing. As we, listen, listen. If, it's gonna, if we're going to make a change in 2016, make it this. Say, I'm going to put the spiritual ahead of the physical. I'm going to say, I'm not telling you not to have a good time. I'm certainly not telling you not to enjoy yourself. I'm not saying, I'm not saying, put down that bacon cheeseburger. I'm not saying that. (laughs) Not saying that. I'm saying this. The opportunity, the opportunity to feed the flesh or the opportunity to feed the spirit, which one will you take? Try to carry that through and see what God does for us. Listen. This life, this life is an experiment. We're going to see, in the next five minutes, I'm going to see if I'm still breathing. Okay? Make, an, make, an, make this your experiment. Make the spirit. Look at, look, listen, God is going to present you with some choices. I guarantee this is going to happen before the day is out. God is going to present you with some kind of a choice where you can say, I can kind of kick it towards the spiritual side or I can kind of kick it towards the physical side. And then you're going to, you're going to see exactly what the Bible says about that. Whose choice is it? Your choice. Your choice. Listen, God didn't force you to get saved. He's not going to force you to be spiritual. It's a choice you will make. You'll have to see. You do. You're going to have to try it. You know, I work in a laboratory. We can do experiments all day long. We don't know if they're going to work. We just go in and we see what's going to happen. Sometimes, sometimes we blow things up in the process. Okay? We've done that. We've been there, done that. Sometimes we've made a really big bang. Okay? I'm saying this. Try it. Try it and see what God does for you. Because that's what, that's what, listen, the world's not getting better. The world's getting worse. We're going to be different. We're going to be different. We're going to stand out. If we're going to live for Jesus, we're going to stand out more. And listen, that doesn't mean people are going to love you more for it. Maybe they won't. But guess what? Who are we here? Who, Who should we be seeking to please? The one who died for us. No one else. No one else has come from where he came from and done what he did, and then gone back to prepare a place for us. But Jesus, let's remember him. Let's remember him in our choices in 2016.